As the pub filled with people, two strangers sat down at Barrington's table. Just shortly after half seven, two other people came in, uh, a man and a woman. Uh, both had Irish accents, were carrying suitcases. Um, they asked if they could come and sit with us. We said yes. They offered to buy us drinks. They were talking, having a good time. They seemed very pleasant and nice people. When they were going, the gentleman was trying to coax us out of the pub and telling us not to stay in there. We said, no, we're going to stay. We're enjoying ourselves. We're going to leave shortly anyway. The strangers left, but unknown to Barrington, one of their bags remained, hidden under a chair beside him. Shortly after they left, we heard a, an explosion around the corner. The tavern actually shook. The lights flickered. And, I mean, it was a foregone conclusion that it was, it was probably a bomb that had gone off. One of the first people on the scene that night was Police Constable Pete Chandler. His regular beat took him towards the mulberry bush, packed with drinkers. I was at, uh, posted at Digbeth Police Station, which was one of the two main city, Birmingham city centre police stations. It was just any, like a normal day as far as the city centre was concerned. I just set off on foot from Digbeth Police Station as I was getting up towards New Street and by the rotunda, there was a terrific explosion. And that was it. I never heard a noise like it in all my life. I hadn't got a clue what what it was. Just after ten past eight in the evening, a bomb exploded in the mulberry bush immediately below the rotunda. All I could see was a huge pool of grey, misty smoke. My heart started beating ten to a dozen. Sweat started coming on the back of my neck. Um, because although you wear a police uniform, your reactions are just the same as anybody else's. I didn't see anyone, and I thought, I'm going to be the first one here. Those in the tavern in the town, just round the corner from the explosion, had no idea of the danger they were in. And um, One of the barmaids said to me, oh, wouldn't it be nice? If we had a bomb scare, you know, we could all go home. Two minutes after the first explosion, the second bomb went off in the tavern in the town. There was a flash of light, a flash of light which took a, literally a second. There was a, there was a muffled bang or, or a muffled explosion. And the next thing I know is I'm in the pitch blackness. I'm right across the other side of the room with rubble on top of me, and I'm actually facing the bar area. I was serving uh, a, a man to a pint of beer, and sort of directly to my sort of left, I saw a big flash of light, and instinctively, um, I just sort of dropped the glass and put my hands to my face. I don't know how long it had been, but after a while, there was people. I could hear people rummaging around. I could see flashlights through small cracks in the debris, and I managed to to put my hand up through this this crack. And there was somebody shouting down the stairs, "Is, is there anybody in there?" And it was a few minutes before I sort of gathered my thoughts and picked myself up and staggered up the stairs. Well, the pub was quiet. By the time I staggered out. It was very, very quiet, very, very dark. No more laughter, no more music, no, just complete darkness. Obviously, I, I, I stepped on a few things as I, as I left the top. Those could have been bodies, I, I don't really know. Some of them were soft. There might well have been bodies that I was stepping on. But as I, as I staggered across from the bar area, up the stairs, yes, I, I was stepping on things. But obviously, you're not thinking of what they are. You just basically want to get out. Bodies just lying around on the... It was just like a sea of bodies on the carpet. Um, there was an awful lot of blood. I saw 
sort of looked down and I saw the injuries to my leg. I noticed my right leg first. Uh, the skin, the skin was, was obviously blown off and it was flapping in the cold night air. There was blood running down my leg. New Street was devastation. There was glass, broken glass everywhere. There were ladies there screaming. Screaming, I couldn't make out what they were saying, screaming and shouting. And I, and I was shaking because I, I, at that time I thought, this is it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die. Back at the Mulberry Bush, Pete Chandler found that his training barely prepared him for the enormity of the situation. The injuries were, were so appalling, I didn't know where to start. It was pointless taking out a bandage. I had no idea what to do. Ten people were killed in the Mulberry Bush. In the tavern in the town, 11 died. You could not imagine that anybody came out of there alive. It was unrecognisable as a pub. The colours had gone. It was just grey, black, burnt, scorched, furniture blown apart, no ceiling. And it was, it was just unbelievable that something like this could happen. It was terrible burnt clothing, I say, and limbs uh, strewn across the uh, across different parts of the building, and the the poor person not realising that it was their arm or leg that was there. Some are obviously dead, even to to someone who's never seen a, a dead person. The Birmingham ambulance service was overwhelmed with casualties. Taxi drivers stepped in to ferry the injured and dying to Birmingham's hospitals. Um, we were bundled into taxis which had probably previously taken people to the hospital and you know, there was blood inside these taxis. People coming in with all sorts of injuries, lost limbs, um, lost partners. Um, it really was quite horrific. By nine o'clock that evening, nearly 200 casualties had been treated in the city's hospitals, including Barrington Berry. Because uh, when I was taken to the hospital, they, they wouldn't let me look in the mirror for about two weeks. I was in a ward on my own. I had a, a nurse stationed outside, or a, a nurse stationed inside uh, my uh, ward, 24 hours a day, keeping an eye on me. And uh, from what I was told, two days after the explosion, um, they actually asked, asked the priest to come down and give me the last rites because they, they thought uh, that was it for me, curtains. I'm very lucky. I was very lucky to survive. Very lucky indeed. The young man that I actually swapped my shift with died. And that haunts me because if we hadn't swapped that night, I would have died like that. When the investigation reopened 17 years later, police confirmed that Barrington was probably drinking with the bombers that night. And the alcove in which they all sat had been the center of the explosion. It was only after the event that we sort of thought, well, why were they so anxious for us to sort of leave the pub and to go with them around the corner? I was literally sitting on the bomb. The bomb was literally where I was sitting. The bomb was right under the chair. I will not walk down New Street. I cannot walk down New Street. She couldn't pay me enough to go back down there. That's how badly I feel about it. It's stuck in my head was the people on the floor. It was just customers, friends, people you don't know, just people. Six men were arrested and charged with the bombings. They were convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. After 17 years, they were released after new evidence emerged. The real culprits are still at large. On March the 30th, 1979, the Houses of Parliament became the unlikely scene of a political assassination. The bomb went off shortly before three o'clock. A car bomb rocked the British government to its foundations and, and provoked the largest security shakeup the country has ever seen. 
The bomb had in fact been placed in the blue Vauxhall car belonging to the shadow Northern Ireland secretary, Mr. Airy Neave. Airy Neave, war hero, popular conservative MP for Abingdon, and close friend of Margaret Thatcher was killed when a bomb exploded in his car as he left the Palace of Westminster. First on the scene was Police Constable Eric Stunt. He was in the Royalty Protection Branch of the Metropolitan Police Service. It was, I believe, a Friday, Friday afternoon, sort of mid-afternoon, and there was a tremendous explosion. Tremendous, but I mean, really, quite something. I was standing on top of the ramp and saw the vehicle down there, which obviously had gone, so I made my way down very cautiously. I felt as though I had to go down there. I had probably had the option, but I had to go down. There was a human being down there, so I had to make my way down there. About a week or two previous to told, if there's an incident like this should occur, we must not go anywhere near a vehicle, but um, that wasn't the way it was. That's not the way. To, sometimes rules are made to be broken. One has to cut corners. And I decided to go down there, and I took it upon myself. Some MPs were still around in the Palace of Westminster when the bomb went off. One of them was Labour MP, Tam de Yell. The first person I ran into, I went out into the corridor and met an ashen-faced Michael Cox, uh, who was then uh, Chief Whip. And um, he said, uh, Airy Neve, uh, has been very badly injured in a bomb explosion. Now, I'd heard the great thud and really thought a little more about it. Harry Neve was leaving for his Abingdon constituency for a formal dinner with the councillor, John Jones. This particular Friday happened to be the... Um, Sake ball and banquet of the chairman of the Vale of the White Horse. And Ari, of course, with his lady, had been invited. And we were all getting organised to go in for this meal first of all, you see. And sitting down, just being to sit down, and my wife, who knows, was due to sit next to Ari, and she was looking at this empty chair, you see. And of course, the chairman said, Well, all these parliamentarians are always late, you know, so we never thought anything of it. But my wife was looking at this empty chair right next to her. And then before we could get started, the police were all over the place, dogs and things, and we heard the terrible story of what had happened. That was on that particular night, and it was a dreadful occasion. Harry Neve was the Shadow Northern Ireland secretary and was Margaret Thatcher's right-hand man. Mrs Thatcher, then the leader of the opposition, was in North London when she heard the news. At precisely the time the explosion occurred, Mrs Thatcher was seven miles away with two disabled people who were to receive special cars. When Mrs. Thatcher was given the news minutes later, nobody knew that the victim was one of her closest friends. Immediately, police threw a cordon around Westminster in an attempt to catch the killers. I can't convey to you the sheer horror of it having happened you know, at the heart of British government. It was inconceivable that such things should happen right here. The murder of one of our own inside the Palace of Westminster, it was a traumatic event. There was this silence, a tremendous silence after the explosion. It's a stillness, you can't quite explain it. It sort of stays, stays with you, it's something you can't forget. It's a greyness, a grey, a grey feeling and everything was still. Very sinister, very, very sinister. Barry Neve was trapped in his car for half an hour. He'd suffered horrendous injuries to his legs and face. Eventually he was taken to Westminster Hospital, where he died from his injuries shortly afterwards. I'm sure that he, Mr Neve, was aware of what happened, but there was a, a presence there, another being there if you like, and I tried to make him as comfortable as I could. And I stayed with him and I told him and I spoke to him that I would stay with him as long as I can and be with him. The bombing was unprecedented in the UK. There had not been a bomb attack on the palace since Guy Fawkes was caught in the cellars beneath Westminster 400 years before. 
Police reconstructed how the bomb may have been planted in Airy Neve's blue Vauxhall Cavalier while it was parked outside his London home. Initially, both the IRA and the Irish National Liberation Army claimed responsibility for the bombing. He refused to take any form of police protection. Obviously, he would first thing that you would consider. Uh, he was he was advised to take it. Um, even his vehicle was not parked up in a garage. In a, in a garage, it was left outside. The cosy club atmosphere of Parliament was shattered after the death of Airy Neath. As forensic teams poured over the wreckage of his car, it became apparent that the attack had been extremely well planned. Well, I would think that it had a delayed arming uh, system there where the man could set a small watch and after a period of time the bomb suddenly became armed and then there would probably be an anti-disturbance type switch so that when the car was driven up a ramp or, or joggled in its driving that would set, actually set the bomb off. Is that easy to make? Quite simple. The bomb itself was a Mercury tilt bomb so when the vehicle actually comes out of the car park goes up the ramp to make its exit the cylinder type bomb the cylinder mercury type would tilt on acceleration hence the explosion Barry Neve had been a war hero he'd escaped from Colditz Castle during the Second World War and was highly thought of in political circles his position as Shadow Northern Ireland secretary came at a price. He did say to me that he knew he was a target. On the surface, he was a very quiet, gentle man. He wasn't at all bombastic. But of course, the soft voice and the quiet demeanor uh, concealed the war hero uh, that we all knew he had been. He's a hero without heroics, uh, because we, he never ever discussed, I never knew the exploits he'd gone through the war, and it wasn't in fact until he published his books that we realised what he'd been up to. Barry Neve's friendship with Mrs Thatcher was a great asset. He was instrumental in her successful campaign to become leader of the Conservative Party. It was the time of the leadership elections when Mrs. Thatcher was challenging Ted Heath, who was the ex-Prime Minister for the leadership of the Conservative Party. And Airy, with a sort of semi-whisper, said, Tom, if you're a betting man, he said, put your money on the filly. And of course, the filly was a somewhat picturesque <laughs> description of Mrs. Thatcher. But of course, he was right. Tributes poured in for the politician whose career was cut short so tragically by a terrorist act. Ernie Neef had been a damn good Englishman and a soldier. I don't believe that he would in any way have tolerated uh, ill treatment of suspects. He would certainly have searched out the allegation to find out whether or not they were untrue. And the, this murder one of a long series. I have thought that you would somehow get used to this after 10 years. I find that you don't. Everyone hits you again. Barry Neve's death affected Mrs. Thatcher very deeply. She'd lost a loyal and dear friend. I do think it affected her very personally because with Airy Neve alive, with his influence over her, Mrs. Thatcher would have been far less confrontational in general and would have been far wiser in relation to Northern Ireland in particular. Four years earlier, the bomb attacks on the Birmingham pubs had left 21 people dead and 162 injured. But it was the murder of Airy Neve that shocked the establishment. The Palace of Westminster then underwent a huge security clampdown, which is still in place to this day. Before Airy Neve, there was really very little security. You know, it was sort of in and out. And uh, the Palace of Westminster and the British Parliament prided itself on open access 
uh, to electors, visitors, foreigners. Uh, after Erin Eve, everything changed. The horror of the attack was felt all the more because nobody quite believed that it would ever happen at the very seat of democratic government. Although the Irish National Liberation Army was responsible for the attack, no one was ever charged in connection with the crime. Prime Time Crime continues next on Five with what first appeared to be a tragic accident but was revealed as a brutal murder. Arrest and trial is next. Thank you.